testimonies, but not just that. Um, I just want to welcome those of you to our Tuesday night Bible study. I'm really excited of what God is doing. And it is amazing to me, just the power of his word, because he's just awesome. He really has a way to get us together, doesn't he? And I am so, so excited and glad about it. You're trying to just um, get this together here. But one of the things I want, want to say um, on Saturday, for those of you that may have missed it, the after party, that's what I call it, our discussions, um, where we really get a chance to dig into not just the message, but to be transparent with what God is doing, how he is speaking to us and what he wants us to um, understand. There we are. Okay. Now we got it together here. Thank you all so much for your patience. And we are... We are starting. Can everybody see the screen? Let's see if we can get it together here. All right. Okay. I am just grateful, so excited for what God is doing in this series. So you know if all of you have been um are being transformed or really um being uh what's the word I want to use, uh, challenged with this message of salt, um, we have really begun to understand, you know, the importance of what God is saying about this word. It was really not on accident because he does everything intentionally, but I'm just grateful that he has allowed us to dig into the foundation of what covenants are and especially the covenant of salt series. And tonight we're going to um, really talk about what it is, what he, what his purpose is for some of the things that he wants us to know about salt and something, a bowl, a new bowl of salt. Father, we just thank you so much for your word. Thank you, thank you, thank you for everything that you're doing in the hearts of your people, even moving the, the lumps, the bumps, the every place in us where we have not even had a chance to analyze. But Holy Spirit, thank you for highlighting it. Thank you for helping us to get to the place where we fully embrace what your covenant is, what the covenant of the Father is, what the meaning of the salt is, that we can grow in deeper uh, communion and fellowship and highlighting everything in us that needs to be transformed. We willingly um, not just embrace this word, but we, we come humbly and boldly we want to be in full alignment so that we can show forth your glory, so that we can grow closer in fellowship with you, so that we can exemplify this Christ life, this salted life, where you can be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. So we know um, Minister Darlene has so um, carefully gone through the the highlights of what the conservatory and a conservatory is. And those of us, we know that we're studying these, what it means to transform nations, to reinforce covenant, elevating Christ above men and increasing understanding. And actually in the study of, of this lesson, I can see how we're going through all of this because we're being transformed. We're reinforcing um, his covenant. We're elevating Christ above men in our own hearts, those idols, um, are coming down and we're increasing in our understanding of him and his covenant. He's storing up sound wisdom for us because we have come to understand that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So I want to, we went away, let's go back. Okay. And this is just a copyright disclaimer, the things that I've studied or I release or, or uh, are taught in these 
lessons is something that the Lord highlighted to me, and I'm grateful to be sharing it with you. So one of the things that I have um, really come to understand, um, there is, and, and maybe here culturally, maybe some of you have, have had or prepared saltfish, but there was no refrigeration back in the um, Old Testament days. They didn't have refrigerators, deep freezers, or anything like that. They used salt to, prefer, to preserve their fish, their meat, or anything else that needed uh, preservation. Of course, we talked about that there were areas um, where you would have salt merchants. And because there were salt merchants, if they were trying to cheat the people, that were purchasing the salt, they would dilute it with sand, which comes with um, the scripture here in Matthew 5.13, where he says, you are the salt of the earth. If you are diluted, if you lose your flavoring, it is no good for anything. We, we talked about how the salt was a fertilizer, not just a preserver, not just um, some of the other things that we think a preserver or um, we enhance uh, flavors or fertilize or inhibits or whatever. One of the things is that salt cannot lose its chemical makeup. That's the way it is. It can be diluted and lose its effectiveness, but it can never lose um, its chemical makeup. Salt is salt. We learned that salt preserves, that it enhances that it fertilizes it. And I think that was an aha moment for us, that first um, class that the Lord knowing all these things, the Dead Sea was nearby. So when he made a reference about salt, the people understood. But what we may not have known was that salt was also used as a fertilizer. It, it kills uh, debris. It kills that which would cause a stench. So it fertilizes and, and makes neutral that which is unclean. I love how the Lord used this. It inhibits everything that is bad and promotes that which is good in the natural and in our lives as well. So it symbolizes purity, perfection, wisdom, hospitality, durability and fidelity. These also are always exhibited in relationships. When you look at um, any kind of relationships, these are the, the, the examples of the things that you would like to um, embrace. Salt represents the life of God and the sacrifice from us. God commands the offering to be salted, to be consecrated. He said nothing that they offer, nothing that was to be offered uh, would be without salt. And I believe that, you know, we can look on the landscape of the body of Christ and we can see so many things and he really is calling for us to be consecrated, to be set apart because now we can look and all we see is a uh, mixture. There's sand in the salt. And sometimes there's so very little salt or, or any salt at all until the world can't tell the difference because uh, in many ways we look like the world, we talk like the world, we act like the world. There's nothing different and we are called to be holy and consecrated. Uh, scholars believe that the Dead Sea is where Lot's wife is. Under all that, that whatever happened and when uh, that sea, I guess, began, the water begins to flow in that area and create the Dead Sea because there's nothing that can happen. Nothing can go in the Dead Sea. Um, even it is, it is so full of salt that you can just float. And when we are not um, really aware of all these things are, we can look at Lot's wife, she'd look back. So there are things that happen in our hearts, those bumps and those areas that we wanna flush out so that our, our flow is purified. And so that whatever it is, uh, Apostle Teresa teaches us about immersion. Well, there can't be any immersion if the sea is dead, if there's contaminants, if there's something that prohibits what God wants us to dive deep in. Um, 
So we, we are endeavoring to go deeper and allow Holy Spirit to be able to open up our eyes and our hearts and our ears to hear what he is saying. Part of the um, scripture when he says, you are the salt of the earth. If the earth has lost its, if the salt has lost its seasoning, it is good for nothing. He that has an ear, let him hear. So it's important that we're hearing these salted messages individually and corporately um, because it influences everything it comes in contact with. We're supposed to be the influencers. We're supp supposed to be the ones that um, as we come in contact with people and situations and, and, and corporate um, entities and governments and nationalities, we're supposed to influence all of that. But what we can see is that we've lost our we've lost our flavor, we've lost our enhancement, we've lost the ability to fertilize. So he's calling us into this place that we will become salted. It's a perpetual covenant. Um, one of the things that we talked about um, on Saturday was we're the salt of the earth. And one of the things that I knew, I'm not, I'm a city girl, I'm not. Well, let me just say, I grew up in a place where it doesn't snow. So what I found out, and even though I had um, looked at some information about salting the earth, the land, um, there was this example, and I was I was uh, corrected that before the storm comes, that the ground, the, the streets, the highways are salted, and it prevents uh, damage, not just to the 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 highways and the streets but it protects it from any other um decay that could happen it keeps the streets safe from from accidents and whatever so salt is essential to life symbolizing god's faithfulness and love for his people salt is uh without in the natural we would suffer malnutrition i didn't know that Salt symbolizes fellowship, faithfulness, fidelity in human relationships. And during the Sabbath, bread is actually dipped in salt during a meal as a, as a remembrance um, of the covenant that God made to his people. Now, one of the fun facts that we learned last week that if a person, you know, wants to get out of a covenant, you know, that they were considered of spilling the salt. And I hope those of you that uh, remembered that went back to uh, the painting by Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci of the Lord's Supper. And you actually saw where he held the bag, you know, the money, but there was a salt that was spilled on the table. Now, this is not us, but I'm sure in your mind, you may have some idea because people have a lot of suspicions about you, the use of salt. They are, um, they believe there's some magic to it. And I actually saw a video last week where the, the preacher had the people bring in their bags of salt and they would declare the scriptures over, you know, what the salt covenant means or whatever. But I want us to understand that this is what other religions and cultures do. They use it to ward off evil spirits. They place salt in their holy water. They'll sprinkle salt in the foundations of their homes. They'll place bowls of salt near the entrances of their houses. Um, if they were traveling, they put salt in the cars or at the hotel. They'll throw salt over their shoulders or on their doorsteps. Or use these salt bullets that you see here on the screen to kill dangerous entities or ghosts. But you know, all of these are symbols of a people who do not know the God of the covenant because he is enough. Um, and the scripture there is just saying, behold, I am the Lord God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? There have been, we have all been in situations and I was sharing with someone earlier and, and how we were testifying about the, the faithfulness of God in dire situations, in situations situations where we didn't know what the Lord was going to do, but he is faithful to his word. He's faithful to his covenant. 
It doesn't matter what the situation is. He still protects us. He still um, heals. He still is watching out for his people. So he's enough. So if there's anyone here on, on this, in this class, and you are even watching later on the replay, I want to encourage you that he's enough. We don't have to go through all these rituals and, you know, using salt for this and for that. And, and in some of their situations, that's what they have done. That is part of their religion. But I want us to understand that the salt, the salted one, Jesus Christ, is enough for us. We don't have to go through all these games. We don't have to um, try to pull a rabbit out of our hat. We go through all this, this magic. We had a wonderful lesson um, last year when Apostle taught on how um, we look at this, th this stuff and it's magic. That's not for the people of God. So he's really clarifying and, and Unbeknownst to us, sometimes we might have our whole um, mindset based on the idolatry of using symbols and stuff that are not God, that can't bring us any kind of deliverance, can't bring us any kind of help. So he's really clarifying in this season that we fully understand that he's enough and that whatever we need, he has it for us. So what have we learned about covenants? And this is just a review. So there are seven covenants in scripture, the Adamic Edenic, the Noahic, Noah, Mosaic, Abrahamic, Davidic, the New and Everlasting Covenants. These are the covenants that we reviewed on um, last week. And covenants involves two or more parties. You can't have a well, you can make a covenant with yourself, but I mean, you're just making a promise, but a real covenant involves um, one or more, that's just say one or two or more parties. Um, when there's a marriage, there's a wedding, there's a husband and a wife. Um, if, if there's an agreement, those of you that um, have a job or you have a business, you've entered into a covenant with that employer or with that client. The covenant must be based on the full knowledge of all parties regarding obligations and commitments. You cannot be in a covenant if you don't know the rules. You can't say, uh, for instance, um, a couple, a married couple, and you see and you understand that, that there is, uh, oh, we're gonna get married. What, 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 what are your vows? What are you agreeing to? And I think these days, a lot of people just get together for the sake of having a big wedding without the covenant of, of really looking into, okay, I'm giving up my life. You're giving up yours. What are we forming here? What are the, the terms? Um, years ago, I was part of a, a union. And so when the agreement, when the covenant, the contract, the bargaining unit would expire, people were ready to go on strike. Why? Because there had to be a renegotiation of the covenant. So it always had to be um, between two or more parties. Everybody had to know what the agreement was, what, what the obligation, what were the commitments. It must be written down or fully comprehended. Um, sometimes there, was, there wasn't anything written down but it was a handshake or, or uh, in the Old Testament, I believe it was with, um, let's see, Ruth, when they went to meet to see if Boaz could get Ruth, he went to the elder or the one that was um, the redeemer, the one that had the right to redeem her as a wife and what they would do was they would do it by sh taking off their shoes. So covenants wasn't always written down, but it had to be fully comprehended. Some of the covenants you entered to by choice, nobody was forcing you. God doesn't force us to do anything. He says, this is my covenant. Whosoever will let them come. So it's not by force. Unfortunately, 
uh, religion has has um, hurt a lot of people because we try to make folks safe. We can't make people safe. We can't we can't uh, make them do right. Take the Lord, you know anything. We cannot force people. They have to, no matter how bad we want them to come in, come in the real covenant with Him. They have to make that choice. And I'm grateful that the Lord loves us so much until we get to the place of being agreeable because we come to understand that there's nobody like Jehovah. There's nobody that loves us. And, and we have all gotten into that place. And I don't know um, if there's anybody here that was just like, oh yes, I wanna be saved there was a circumstance that happened that provoked our understanding that I need a savior. I need deliverance. I need God. So he doesn't force us, but how privileged we are that we come to the realization that we can enter into this covenant by, by choice and that we have been chosen to walk um, this life out. Covenants are established for a purpose and biblical covenants were instituted by God. They can be conditional or unconditional. And so, as you can see at the bottom of your screen, different words that um, highlight uh, what the synonyms are for covenants, vow, pledge, agreement, arrangement, bargain, commitment, contract, deed, handshake, and so on. Now, I want you to get your Bibles. You can also Look here on the screen. We're going to talk about um, something that has to do with assault at one, one that assault. Um, uh, Elisha, well, both of them, Elijah and Elisha, um, were prophets of the Lord. This is 2 Kings, the second chapter. And if you would even go back into 1 Kings and you began to um, look at when Elisha was approached by Elijah, he said, okay, he threw his mantle on him and said, hey, come on. He said, wait, wait, hold up, hold up. Let me go say goodbye to my, 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 my mom, my dad. And he said, okay, whatever. So he went, he was plowing when Elijah called him. He burnt his plow. He cooked up <laughs> uh the oxen had a big farewell party with his family and ran after the man of God. Now look at that in our pursuit of all that God has for us and how sometimes we, even though we don't understand, uh, um, but when he calls us to do something, it's time to get in a hurry. It's time to really put stuff aside, especially now in this day and time, we don't have time to, uh, you know, be half stepping or or slowful in the things of God or backing up and moonwalking and you know trying to figure out is you know he will guide us into all truth we have to understand that whatever it is that we need from him whatever it is he wants from him uh he's going to see to it that he will get you to the place of equipping but we have to be willing to fall in line and get into alignment. So there are a couple chapters from the time that you see Elisha running after Elijah and it doesn't mention that anymore. And then sometime later you start seeing, oh, during the time when you see that there is no mention, you can best believe there is mentoring going on. There is impartation going on. And we can see here, um, in um, 2 Kings 2, and it says, and it came to pass when the Lord was about to take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. So here they are walking and now the mentorship is over. Um, Elijah has been a prophet of fire. His assignment was to make sure that he got Israel back into alignment with God. They had went far into idolatry. There were many kings that um, introduced things that were against Yahweh. So um, his, uh, his ministry 
was to call out evil and destroy idolatry. And, you know, people didn't really um, like him, but he definitely was on assignment for God. So here they are, they're walking. And then Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me to sent me on to Bethel. So Elijah knew something was up, but Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Now the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel, this is a company of prophets, came out to Elisha and said to him, do you know that your Lord will, will that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And he said, yeah, I know. Keep silent. In other words, shut up. You don't get away from here with all that. So then Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. Look at that dedication. Look at that faithfulness. That is, this is a salt covenant that they have. So they came to Jericho. Now the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho, this is the second group of prophetic people, prophets at Jericho, came to Elisha and said to him, do you know that the Lord is going to take your master away from you today? So he answered, yeah, I know it. Keep silent. Now, I don't know if keeping silent was going to change anything because God was coming for Elijah. Then Elijah said to him, stay here, stay here. It's like he said, the time of my departure is, is at hand. He said, for the Lord has sent me on the Jordan. I'm going to another place. But he said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. And 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood facing them at a distance. While the two of them stood by the Jordan. Now Elijah took his mantle, rolled it up, struck the water, and it was divided this way and that so that the two of them crossed over on dry ground. Do you see the progression of what's happening here? Do you see um, the fellowship that is happening? Do you see the alignment that is happening? Do you see, even in the midst of people trying to tell them prophetically what, yes, what is going to happen, it's like, yeah, it's okay. I already know. Don't say anything because he's like, I don't need to be distracted about the conversation. Though it's true, there's a there's a reason I need to stay in step with my master. Here he goes. And it was so when they had crossed over that Elijah said to Elisha, he knew it's time to get up out of there. He says, ask. What may I do for you before I am taken away from you? Yes, everything they said, the three places we have been and they have highlighted and said, I was getting out of here. I am, I am. But what can I give you before I leave? And he said, please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. Now, he was right in asking for this because the first, well, in, in their culture, the firstborn can ask for a double portion. Here he was, spiritual son, protege, mentee of Elijah. And he says, look, I'm going to make it if you get out of here like this. I, I need what you had. I, I need a double portion of your spirit to be upon me. So he said, you, you've asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I'm taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, if you don't see me when I leave, I can't give it to you. What, is, what was he addressing? You got to stay focused. The stuff you that you're wanting, we've been close. Okay, I can give it to you, but here's the condition of this covenant. Here's this covenant. You asked me for this. Here is what's gonna happen with our covenant. We've been walking together. You've been receiving, I've been imparting. You've been, you've allowed me to pour into you. You've, you've um, embraced the teachings. So now you've asked a hard thing, but here is the conditions of the covenant. You can have it. 
if you see me. How many times God is asking us, this is what, this is what I want for you. Yes, you've asked me for this. I want you to have it, but I need to adjust your perception. What is your focus? Are you seeing me or something else? Keep your eyes up. Then it happened. As they continued on and talked, no, they're just talking now. They even already, you know, gave him the conditions of this promise, this covenant. Then it happened. As they continued on and talked, that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elisha went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it. And he cried out, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. So he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. He also took up the mantle because the mantle fell because he saw the manifestation of the covenant. Took hold of his own clothes, tore them into two pieces, also took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back. They just crossed the Jordan. He just doing what he saw. In the same way that Jesus said, I only do what I see my father do. And the same way in which we should be imitators of that righteousness. He took that mantle of Elisha that, that had fallen from him, that just crossed over. He going back, he struck the water. And he said, where's the Lord of Elijah? Where's this double portion? And when he also had struck the water, it was divided this way and that. And Elisha crossed over. Now, when the sons of the prophets who were from Jericho saw him, they said, the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. Then they said to him, look, now there are 50 strong men with your servants. Please let them go and search for your master. Now, he already knew, he already knew that Elisha hadn't fallen up on the mountain or anything where they were, you know, he was like or in some valley. He already knew where he was. He said, I'm, I'm just watch me when I get out of here. And that was it. He didn't know. And so they kept saying, you know, try to make him feel bad. You need to go search for him. Go find it. Don't you understand how that happens? People want us to search for things that ain't even God. Search for things that aren't even part of who we are supposed to be. It's a distraction. And they tried to get, he said, okay, good. That's what you want to do? Good. They were trying to make him ashamed as if he did not care. Then after they searched three days and didn't find him, then they came back and said, oh, we didn't find him. He said, but that's what I told y'all. I told you. I told you. Now let's go back for a minute. Let's get in your Bible. Let's go back to, because it's not, it's not on this, uh, going to be on your screen here. Second Kings 2, we're going to pick up verse 19. So he, here it is. Then the men of the city said to Elisha, please notice the situation of the city is pleasant. This is nice. This is really nice. They're back and they're in Jordan, back to Jericho. And you say, it's, it's nice over here. But as my Lord can see, but the water is bad and the ground is barren. And he said, bring me a new bowl. And put salt in it. So number one, <laughs> they have they have no bowls, but it was common for the people to have salt, not just for cooking and for fertilizing, but for also offering um, sacrifices. So this was something that Elisha could readily ask. But look at this. So they brought it to him. Then he went out to the source of the water. Now, it doesn't really talk about what the source of the water was, but whatever it was, it was defiled. So he performed 
a purification ceremony based on what he already knew that the priests would do when they make offerings or when they make sacrifices. So the salt taken from the new bowl, he cast it into the water, symbolizes the cleansing of the water for new use. Thus says the Lord, here he releases the prophetic word. Thus says the Lord, I have healed this water. From it, there shall be no more death or barrenness. So obviously, too, there was an issue that you drink the water, the women were, history um, talks about the women were barren. They couldn't have kids. They couldn't have any vegetation because you, you the land was barren. Nothing was, was uh, alive. It looked good. Apostle Teresa has been talking to us um, this last month of are you alive or dead in Christ? We can look alive. We'll be dead inside. We can move, but not have the flow of life within us. So it all looked good. And they were just saying, listen, we know... <laughs> We know you have the technology to understand what needs to be done. All the people that lived there, they liked it. It looked like an, an oasis, but nobody knew the technology of just throwing some salt in the water. And it could be that uh, someone of the right stature or position had to be the one so that when he took it, they gave him a new bowl. They put salt in it. He cast into the water. The waters were purified. And then the prophetic word came. No more. The, I have healed this, this water. From it there shall be no more death or barrenness. So the water remained healed to this day. According to the word of Elisha. Which he spoke. Now, after that, there were some things that's happening. I'm going to let Apostle Teresa talk about that. But one of the things I want to talk to, to conclude this part of our lesson that we'll really get into more is that divine healing is part and parcel of our relationship with God and his children. And we know that because uh, even though we, we suffer from, you know, sickness and pain, something goes wrong, we crying out to the Lord. He's the one we go to because Isaiah 53 and 4 says, surely he has borne, he's carried our griefs, our sicknesses, and he's carried our sorrows. Um, in Hebrew, the word translated griefs and sorrows literally means sicknesses and pain, respectively. The word rendered born is a Levitical term, meaning not sympathy, but the actual bearing away and removal utterly of the thing that that has been born so usually what happened is we either don't believe that he'll heal us or we don't take our spiritual medicines this weakens our belief system this the word his word strengthens our spiritual immune system so the people knew to ask the prophet hey um stuff ain't right here what's the remedy but we don't often understand where we need to go for our healing. So how can you improve your immune system? On the whole, your immune system doesn't, now this is in the natural. Your immune system does a remarkable job of defending you against disease causing microorganisms. But sometimes it fails. We've all been there. We've got a cold, we have the flu or something happened. A germ invades successfully and makes us sick. It's impossible to intervene in this process and boost. Is it possible to intervene in this process and boost our immune system? What if you improve your diet? You know, that's what they say. Change your diet. Take certain vitamins or herbal preparations. And I'm all for that. Make a, a lifestyle changes. Maybe you need to exercise in hope of producing a near perfect immune response. But... How have we strengthened our own uh, spiritual Im immune system? How, what have we done to make sure 
that we are in covenant, that our souls are healed. And sometimes, and you guys know I have to sneak it in, I have um, had the privilege of uh, ministering to people who were sick. Um, there was there was no um, nothing that could point to it, and I have been that person. So let me let me just talk about me. So for eighteen months, um, I I was sick, stomach pain every day, every day. I went back and forth to the doctor. They could find nothing. No x-ray would turn up anything. The blood wouldn't turn up anything. It was it was crazy. Scans, every, nothing, nothing would give us answers as to what was wrong. Everything was right until I start saying, Lord, come on, what, what's going on here? What, what, what do I need to do? Cause you know, when you get desperate, you started, Ooh, you be seeking God for real. And so I asked him and, and he starts saying, you know, the way you think about things, the, the way you feel about some things, those, those knots in your soul. I know what that person did. I saw it. I saw what they did, but I saw how you responded. And I was like, but he said, I'm not saying you're not justified in what happened. I'm just saying you need to let that bitter root go. And he began to massage my heart, work out that nut. Now on Saturday, we talked about process because we want stuff done right away. God fix it right now. We ain't got time to be dealing with this stuff. But what do we learn when we're going through and we're waiting on God to move, to heal us, to heal our wounds, to heal our hearts, to heal our souls, to heal our bodies, heal our spirits? What happens if we're being salted? What happens while we're waiting for God's promise to manifest? Are we complaining? Are we walking in bitterness? Unforgiveness, an attitude. Are we standing still when he said to go forward? Are we going forward when he said to stand still? What area of disobedience is he trying to get you to see? That was me. I'm grateful for his long suffering but he put his hand right on it and started dealing with me about my responses to some of the things that were happening that I didn't like. You know how we do. God, you why, why didn't you do something? You saw what they did. He said, yeah, I see it. I see you too during that 18 months of pain every every day, he began to massage that knot out of my heart, being salted, not assaulted. It feels like you're being assaulted, but you're being salted. He rubbed that out and then I'd have a day, one day, 24 hours of no pain and I would get happy. And then the pain was back. Go another month, two days. You almost get afraid to do anything because you're expecting that pain. He kept reminding me. He said, okay, here's another thing. Let's clear that up. So for 18 months, he worked on my belief system. Because sometimes we don't believe God. 
We act like we're his enemy when he's already told us we're his beloved. But he chastens those he loves and he scourges every son. We don't like that part of the sonship, but we're being made in the likeness and image. We're being immersed in this salted life. So when he begins to work those things out of me and the process was done for, for now, for then, one day, no pain, two days, no pain, three days, no pain, one month, no pain. And then from there, I knew I was healed. But it took that process in me to cry out to say for real lord what is it so for a lot of us it's a soul thing he wants to move the knots out of our souls here's some of our promises about healing now how do we even um do we even confess these vitamins i don't think i don't know if you can see the background where all these pills are in the same manner in which we will consume these pills, how about consuming the word? What are, what are we ingesting? What do we believe about the goodness of the Lord? Does, does healing, is that included in the covenant? Am I part of that covenant? Does his promises mean the same for me? Or maybe he wasn't talking to me. Maybe he didn't mean it for me. But we're his covenant. Jeremiah 30, 17. But I will restore you. Restore, restore, restore. That means you were healthy. I will restore you to health and heal your wounds, declares the Lord. Anybody been wounded? Jeremiah 33 and 6. Behold, I will bring to it health and healing. Healthy, bring it back to health and healing. And I will heal them and reveal to them abundance of prosperity and security. It's not too good to be true, it's true. Psalm 62, six and two. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are troubled. This was David. So for those of us, we get a little older, get a little stiff. Maybe there's a little Arthur and a little Bur Bernie, arthritis and bursitis. He's crying out, heal my bones. It get too cold sometimes. Lord, heal my bones. Psalms 103, two to three. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all my iniquity, who heals all, all means all, my diseases. All of them. Forgiveness and healing. It's part of the covenant. Psalm 147 and 3. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Has your heart been wounded? Have you been brokenhearted? Has something hurt your heart? He heals that. James 5, 15. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. All of this is in the covenant. All of it. Healing. Abundance, prosperity, security. Forgiveness. First Peter 2, 24. And this is just a really small, 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 small piece of a great big covenant because we serve a great big God. This is just a little. I'm going to encourage you to put together a whole, your whole list wherever you need healing from and ingest it. 
and preach it to yourself. Preach it to that issue that's bothering you. Confess it, declare it, decree it. Let this be your vitamin. Let this be your medicine. I'm not telling you to stop taking your medicine. I'm not saying that. I am just saying in conjunction, this, because he's faithful, he's just, he forgives our sins. There's just so much part of the covenant because the body of Christ, I'm not saying everybody. I'm just saying that we will run to everything else for entertainment and whatever it is that we want, thinking that it might help us feel better. But here are the promises of God, not just to feel better, but to become whole. So he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. All of this is part of the salt covenant. He wants us to get to a place that we could understand how much he loves us, how much he cares for us. And I'm grateful that Jesus made the sacrifice. He's the only sacrifice. He's the only one perfect. We talked about that Saturday. He was the only one, the only perfect sacrifice that could throw our bond and bring us into proper fellowship with the Father. And I'm so, so glad about that. Next week, we'll talk more and more about um, this wonderful covenant we have because I have to honestly um, confess to you that there's so much more that we're not taking advantage of. It's like um, you're being left all these benefits in a will and you don't even know that you're an heir or a joint heir. It's just like that. So we are uh, just excited, grateful for us to um, dig in and understand the benefits of this covenant relationship that we have in Christ. Father, we just thank you so much right now. All that you have purposed for us in the covenant, expand our understanding, download this wisdom, expand the knowledge of all this covenant, this salt covenant, everything that you have uh, placed um, for us to achieve everything that we may not have even understood, the blessedness, the provision, not just the things that we have, um, we know in our current understanding, but there is so much more that we want to understand, so much more we need uh, to know about all that you have given us. We stand ready even the more, Father, from the very beginning to the end of of your word from Genesis to Revelation. And there's so much more to dig. And I pray, Father, that uh, the habit of study will come upon all the conservators and we will not be lazy and not digging out what it is that you have for us. Holy Spirit, thank you for your quickening power. Even those on the line tonight, if there's healing in their bodies, we thank you for the benefit of healing and the promise of your word that we can stand on your word and expect you to move. We will not be impatient. We will not give up in the process of the way. We thank you because you're faithful. We thank you that you heard us when we prayed. We thank you when you saw us undergoing all the trial and all the tribulation, but all of that, Father, is uh, making us to be that salted one that you're calling for. We thank you for this word. We bless you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I just want to just say this was wonderful. And we thank God for um, the teaching and the series. And we just bless you, Apostle Pam, for just pouring so richly in us. Listen, I want to add some things um, tonight to this. So I hope you have a few more minutes. I, I, hope, I know that we have moved a little long. Um, in the beginning with the comments, but I think that um, 
what the Lord is sharing with me is important for us. And we're going to still, if you want to stay a little bit, I think some of you may have questions yes. with what Apostle Pam has taught. And I want to give you that opportunity. But there are just a couple of things that I want to um, remind you of. Um, there are some things that we've taught in the conservatory over the years that I think are very important right now. I just want to remind you that um, the ultimate mantle is the mantle of Jesus Christ. Um, that's something that I've always told you. We're grateful for Elijah and Elisha. And um, I love how Apostle Pam closed that out. But I always have to say that when we're teaching things from um, the previous covenant, because we have a better covenant now and Jesus is at the center. So before I go any further, I just want to make sure that you guys understand that um, point that I'm making. So if you yes. can just let me know in the chat before I say anything else. Yes. There's a reason for me saying this, and I'm going to explain it to you in a, in a minute. Okay, good, good. So, and I mean, some of you, you know, the greatest anointing in the earth is Jesus Christ now, right? Yes. So every anointing, every grace, everything that all these people walked in, remember, Jesus became it all. And from from the first day of the scribal of the scribal conservatory to now, that has been one of our fiercest points. So when we talk about Christ over Moses, I just want to remind you, and I hope we're still recording. Are we still recording? Because I don't want to lose this. Yes. You know, I don't want to lose this part. People will argue. Nobody can win this argument with me. I'm just going to tell you. No one can win this argument with me. Everything we need, according to First Peter, is in Jesus Christ. Yes. So before we start talking about that I'm like Elijah and the anointing of Come Jeremiah on, is over me, I just want to deal with all of that before we even Come get on. into this next part of the teaching. And so I may need to reteach that line by line, you know, so that we get it. So that people are not claiming graces when we have something greater. Amen. So that's the first thing. I also want you to know that, um, so because of this, I want you to know that the greatest, and the Apostle Pam shared this in her teaching, but the greatest example of salt is Jesus Christ. Jesus salt. Is so before I share this next part with you, so that's <laughs> part number one. Oh. Is that everything we need for life and godliness is in Jesus Christ. The second thing I want to share with you is that there's um, the greatest example of salt and the greatest saver is Jesus Christ yes. in the earth as demonstration and in heaven. So that's the second point. And so that's very, 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 very important. Why? Because all we pursue is image and likeness. Amen. And that's the whole point of image and likeness, a, 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 um, a holistic image and likeness, not a visual or a perceived one. Amen. And that is the salt life. That is the salt life. So mm -hmm. that's one, that's two. The third thing is, I got to share this with you because it was revelation with me and I've had a good time working it out with Apostle Pam. And I love this with the teachers on um, Tuesday nights. I love the opportunity to listen to you and then to go back and share with you because I'm a scholar and oh, all of these things that I have learned begin to converge into revelation. And it's just amazing. And one of the mantles on the Scribal Conservatory is that we have understanding. But I want to tell you why people often would ask if Jesus was Elijah. And I want to talk to you about why people often in biblical times often wonder, is this Elijah? Has he come? Because remember, the conversation was about the spirit of Elijah, right? Mm -hmm. uh, before I go further, I want to see that you're following me. Are you following me? I need yes. to see more yeses. I need to see more I'm following. I'm, I need to see I'm getting this. I need to see I'm understanding. I need to see that this is becoming revelation to me. So I want you to understand that there's a fourth class of prophets. What we have, what we have been taught has only been the Nabi, Jose, and the um, Roe realm. 
And so listen, this is not for your school of the prophets. This is not this kind of teaching. So I'm, I'm not doing that. This is not going to turn into something. Um, but you're not going to find it on Google. This is an mm -hmm. academic study. I need to tell you this. <laughs> this is academic and there are academic books that that broke this thing down um, and and just blew me away. And so the Lord has given me the ability to synthesize academic information and be able to share it with you. And some of you know, years ago, I you know, there are only two or three people I gave this book to or got this book for because I know they have the ability to be able to siphon through it and pull out the treasure. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> there's a, a, a word in Hebrew that we have not really translated to its fullness. And it's the word we use called Nabi. Nabi was not just one type of prophet. There was another type of prophet that came from that Hebrew word. Mm -hmm. And if you know me, you know that I've studied the Hebrew language. You know that I understand Greek, Aramaic. I know how to break those things down. And the living um, word is the Hebrew language. It's mm -hmm. the language God chose to speak to Moses in. So mm -hmm. one day I will talk to you about that. Because I think we miss a lot of things in scripture when we don't understand the nature of the Hebrew language. It, it, we have different seasons in life. And so for the first decade of my ministry um, to the Lord, not just, I'm not talking about to people, but to the Lord, the Lord had me really in a whole Messianic culture, everything Jewish, everything. And then he started bringing me out of that. And with great understanding, great revelation, great insight in the sense of, listen, I'm a son of a king, you know, in that regard. And so I was able to shed Judaism because, listen, for a season, I was heavily into it. But the Lord broke that down, took me out of the culture, but made understanding. I'm only sharing that with you because I need to say this. Yeah. When you understand the world of Hebrew, the language I'm talking language now, the entomology of the words, but understanding the revelation of every dot and every tittle. Come on. Each letter in the Hebrew language is understood to be a revelation by itself mm. because there is no letter. There are only characters. There's only combinations of characters. The Hebrew, the ancient Hebrew language has no alphabet in the way we understand the alphabet. So mm -hmm. I just want to say that. And if you study, you know that what I'm saying is true. Yes. I can't go any further because it's just every single character has an entire realm of revelation attached to it. So just pulling Nabi, Jose, and um, what mm -hmm. is it? Um, Roe from the English language, it does nothing for us. It's basically what I'm saying. But there was a type of prophet and that type of prophet was called the, um, let me, let me, I want to, I want to, I wrote it down so that I could pronounce it correctly and I'm going to spell it for you. Please don't let Google mess you up. So I'm not asking you to go on Google because you're not going to find many people talking about this uh, unless you specifically know where to look. You have to know where to go where you're not going to get a bunch of Google stuff because a lot of that stuff is crazy. But the okay. name of the prophet was is, I-S, parentheses, ha, H-A, close parentheses, Elohim. Hmm. and this prophet and they talk about it in the new covenant too but we miss it because people don't understand the the english words i don't care what bible you're in just does not do justice to the hebrew language it doesn't it doesn't that's why nobody can convince me of a particular bible because i know what the language of god is has Come nothing on. to do with translations. It has to do with study. Come on, Apostle. And so, um, but there are some translations that are horrid. And you already know that because I've, I fight against those. And um, you already know, I don't like, people love the passion. I don't, you know, but don't worry about it. It's okay. Don't be mad. I can't stand that translation of the Bible. 
any more than I can stand the New Living Translation or the Message Bible. I'm a scholar. I can't deal with Come that. On. Come on. But this is what you need to know about is Ha Elohim. And I'm going to take you to the scripture on this. Elijah was a type of prophet that is re very rare in the Bible. In fact, the Bible only um, lists two or three prophets in the entire Bible that fall in this category. It doesn't mean that Elijah was better than all the other prophets. What it does mean is that his calling was more intense and his calling was divinely directed because Elisha, hear me in the spirit, was the very representation of who Jesus Christ would be. Come on. Come on. He was a foreshadowing of the Christ in a way that no other prophets were. He walked in a level of faith, a level of belief, a level of understanding his role that um, is uncommon, even in this day. There, nobody can claim to be like Elisha unless today they understand who Christ is. Mm. So listen, why am I sharing you with this, sharing this with you? Because at its bare bones level, the prophet you're reading about in Second Kings was salt. Yes. And he was light. He lived that. Oh. Remember, how many people did you see in the scriptures caught up? I, I just want you to think about that for a minute. Why Elijah? Yep, you can think about Enoch too, but unless you read the book of Enoch, but I'm not going to go there because it's not in our canon. I have. Amen. But Amen. that's, I don't teach you guys that because most people don't understand the difference between the Orthodox canon and the, uh, the uh, uh, 66 books of the council, right? Mm -hmm. But I want to tell you that our the apostles of Jesus' day actually did teach from other books yes. but that's another story that's another story mm -hmm. not this story has nothing to do with it we're dealing with the 66 books so what i want you to know is that the term that i just gave you of this particular prophet type that springs from a relationship in the nabi realm is the type of prophet that actually can live a holy life Come on. without spot or wrinkle. People think that every prophet in the old covenant had spots and wrinkles. But when Elijah moved into his mature space, he was transformed long before he got caught up. Are you guys following me so far? Yes. You got to get this. Yes. And Eli listen, Elijah did it without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Remember, God fell upon, he came upon, he walked with, but God did not indwell. At every absolute moment in the prophets of old's life. This is why I want you to see why Elijah is so special in this story. Are you guys with me? Yes. Listen, I'm going to say this. It might make some of us really angry, but we have the indwelling and we do not maximize it. Come on. We don't, we don't prioritize God. We prioritize our hopes. We prioritize our dreams. We prioritize that man. Come on. That woman, come on, but we want to be called something, <sighs> but we're not willing to give what the man gave who didn't even have the indwelling of the spirit to, to whom much is given, much is required. This was a good message. But most of us are in no place to call ourselves awesome. like Elijah. No place. So I needed to say this because we've been trying to get the conservatory to a place 
And we're going to get there. Some of us are going to get there, even if it's the three of us walking along. If you were to listen, so let me finish with this definition. So this is our Elohim prophet type was called the righteous of the righteous. That's what that means. The righteous of the righteous. It means, um, oh my goodness, there's another term. The righteous man. So, but in our language, we have made the righteous man, that designation, the Lord is looking for the righteous. He's looking for, we don't understand what they're really saying in the scriptures. Oh, it has nothing to do with religion. It's not about following rituals. It's not, it's an, it's a, it's a, man, I think I need to teach this one day. Yes. I need to teach this one day. I've been meditating on this since before the pandemic. That's when I found the book. And I was like, why am I studying this? You know, and I, I understood it intellectually. I understood it analytically, but it hasn't been until the last year that I'm going to say those things have become revelation to me. And that I understand the greater call. Look at yourselves. Apostle. please because we're not getting this Eliza was the salt life Elijah was and so this is this is the part I want to tell you because Elijah's salt life didn't last Elisha's right <laughs> come on <laughs> But listen, that's a whole nother story. Because people would ask, how can you be like this and end up some other kind of way? When I finish with my book, The Goat Generation, that will be clear. Oh, I'm understanding more and more why I could not publish that book. Yeah, I'm, so mad. I'm telling you. But I get it now. Listen, listen, listen. I'm going to read you this. I'm not going to reread 2 Kings 2 um, with what the apostle already read, but we are going to start at verse 19. So, and also that, that, that water was a river, it was a stream in Jericho. Jericho was a city that just had a lot of random springs, but all the springs in Jericho were bad. But in order to understand that, you need to go back in the Bible and study the story of Jericho. But most people will never go that far in understanding this passage of scripture. That's just, they're going to find what fits them. They're going to do their little walk around the city. They're going to claim their covenant of salt and have a great day. But those correlations are extremely critical to your salt life because a lot happened in Jericho. God fought for Jericho. So in order to really grasp what is taking place here, we, we there's some work we have to do study-wise. I can't wait to start and working with Minister Chiquita because we're going to be doing Bible study with y'all. If you want to know how I study, listen to the teachings I've already done on, on how to study the Bible, but we're going to take it even further in this next season because I just have a joy for teaching people how to study the word, if you're willing. While I'm studying, I'll bring you into my study. That's the best way to do it. But here's the thing. Let me read this. Now, the men of the city said to Elijah, the location of this city is good, as my Lord sees, but the water is bad and the land is unfruitful. He said, bring me a new bowl and put salt in it. So they brought it to him. I'm not talking to you about um, the covenant of salt right now. I'm talking to you about when the mantle of Jesus Christ falls upon a person, where how they should be able to operate when the salt has savor. 
Listen, he asked for a double portion of Elijah's anointing. He was asking for Jesus and didn't even know it. Are you following me? Because remember, all of these stories in the old covenants are type and shadow. They're visions of, of Jesus. They're revealing who God is and they're revealing his Christ. We ask for a lot of things sometimes and we don't know what we're asking for, which is a part of the goat generation, right? But it says, so they brought it to him. He went out to the spring of water and threw the salt into it and said, thus says the Lord, I have healed the waters. No more death or unfruitfulness will come. This was because it was the first miracle that he had done after the mantle of Elijah fell. Let's go to the new covenant real quick. I'm not going to read the scripture. You're going to recognize it. A lot of people always try to humanize the Jesus and the water to wine at the wedding. I'm just going to leave that right there and let you study. If people mistook Jesus as Elisha, hear me in the spirit. If they mistook Jesus as Elijah because they recognized that Elisha was the is I Elohim. To them, Elisha was like God. Jesus didn't just turn water into wine for his mother. Are you guys following? Now can you see why people were confused? Why they didn't know? Why they couldn't correlate? But you study that. Here we go, let's go further. I have healed this water from it, so the waters have been healthy until, healthy until this day, according to the word that Elijah spoke. Turning water into wine was about the new. Mm hmm Here we go. No more death or unfruitfulness will come from it because of the salt life. That was a very special miracle. There are only two times in scripture when you see correlations like this, the spirit of Elijah was almost Jesus. <laughs> Not Jesus, but almost. And this is what we have to see. That was a whole lot. And if you follow Elijah's ministry for a little while before he went nuts, you will find that, listen, the salt life brings miracles. It brings signs. And it brings wonders. Can't share any more because it'll ruin my book. But I will tell you this. We're, we haven't gone far enough on, Ema on Emmaus Road. We stopped somewhere. And we got caught up in one revelation. I'll never forget when I learned that every denomination exists the way it exists because somebody got a revelation and couldn't go any further than that revelation. They got enamored with it. They began to worship the revelation. That's why we're divided today. But that's another story. So I just want to add one thing to this and just say, I hope I gave you a lot to think about, a lot to pray about, a lot to consider. But the most sacred prophet in the Bible 
that that the Lord wants today is the righteous man, not the Nabi, not the Roe, not the Elohim, just based on their gifts. Because let's be honest, all we focus on is their gifts. We don't see nothing else but their gifts. We don't see their righteousness. We relate. I get sick of people talking about prophets are depressed all the time. That might be true, but why are we teaching endlessly on cave seasons and we don't even deal with the righteous mind? How to get it, how to grab it, how to maintain it telling you God is speaking to me. Y'all never heard me teach on cave season. I hate that. With a righteous hatred. But now I understand why. Because when you cross over, it's over. And you're able to do the work of the ministry. Listen, one last thing, because people are always talking about these kids that were ate up by these she bears or depending on your. So we're going to go there real quick. So he it says that after um, you again, this won't make sense if you don't know the story of Jericho. It won't make sense to you fully unless you understand what was happening here. Go back, learn about the 42 men, learn about it. And then if you read it in context, it, come, it becomes clear. So, so verse 21, he went out to the spring of water, threw salt into it and said, thus says the Lord, I have healed this water. No more death or unfruitfulness will come from it. Also, I want to tell you, please don't go putting salt in water and sliding them under your bed or throwing salt around your house. Don't do that. That's witchcraft. This is not that. The power is not in the salt. It's in the salt life. So if you're doing any of those things, you need to stop. Because that's the devil. And if anybody is teaching you that, they're leading you astray. You can gargle with it and get rid of that infection, you know, and you can do all the things that Apostle Pam has told you, but the power in this day is in Jesus Christ. Right? Okay, so he went up from there to Bethel. Again, remember what Bethel is. If you don't know, you don't know your word at all. He went to Bethel. Remember, people hated him. They hated the prophets of God. You got to know the background of this stuff. People were killing prophets. The blood of the prophets were everywhere in this day and time. I'm talking physical death. Not the death of the spirit and the soul, but physical death, right? So listen, he, he went up from there to Bethel and going up on the way. So he was going through a city toward Bethel where prophets were hated and ridiculed. So he didn't just randomly curse a group of boys. You got If you read in context, you're going to uh, know what I mean. He said, they were talking about, go up, you bald head. But y'all, what y'all don't realize is that Elijah, that Elisha lived 65 more years after this, which meant he was a young man, probably in his 30s. We don't realize Joseph was 17. Ezekiel was about 13, 14 years old when he started his ministry. These kinds of things do matter when you're talking about the salt life. So listen, also, so this is a man with a brand new mantle. He's walking in all power, twice as much anointing as Elijah had. But you never hear anybody say, I want a double portion like Elisha. 
They always revert back to Elijah because Elijah was real. The spirit of Elijah was like Jesus. It's some little quirky things in the scripture that you have to dig out and look at. Are you guys still okay? Are you with me? Are you following me? <laughs> it's a lot, but go back and read it and listen. I can be overloaded with these kinds of things when I'm in a vein. But I need you to hear this. They are cursing him after his face has shown like light before God. Think Moses, they couldn't look up. I want y'all to pay attention. I hope that you are following me. <laughs> These people, see, they have intel that we do not. They knew what was going on. They knew the people with Elijah. It happened with Moses. <laughs> I mean, let's just keep going. But also Moses went awry. <laughs> you know, but yeah, at the end, but this Elijah didn't miss his anointing. He was caught up. But here we go. Go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. He turned around, saw them. That Our translation is wrong. They were not little boys. They were men. This is one of the reasons why I do my study. So Jesus didn't just, God, I mean, God in this situation, moving on Elisha's life wasn't killing children. These were men mocking along the way. Because they had unrepentant hearts, they were turned there, were, there was no repentance in them. Listen, Elijah, Elisha had the power of God in his mouth. He spoke against them and they were destroyed. That is what happened. But listen, people try to do these things. They try to pray these things. They try to move in this way. They like to brag about it. They, listen. Listen. The only place that you can get here is through salt life. For a moment, Elisha had this kind of power operating in his life. Ooh, I'm telling you, if we understand the source. If we get ourselves together, if we fight to be like him, if we enter the true battle, because it is a battle, you might not even realize it right now, but everybody on this line is fighting for their lives. And some of us don't even know it. We too busy pursuing dreams and hopes and visions outside of obedience to our own faith. Where are you? Are you dead? Or are you alive? Because alive is not dead in a box. It's, 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 it's not a alive in, oh, I'm breathing. It's resurrection. It's transformation for Jesus. Your priority in your life should be Jesus. Not Jesus after you get them dollars. Some of you are neglecting everything that God wants to use to pull you forward. And then you're going to rape Holy Spirit. I hope you listen to this message in this series. We should all be in pursuit of L.I. Halloween, the righteous 
of the righteous. But I wonder if every, but I know from scripture that everybody doesn't have that capacity. Elijah was, was among only two people caught up for a reason. We talking about being raptured. The craziest theology I ever heard in my life. I mean, anyway, I just want you to consider these things tonight. Listen, I, I have great resources, but I don't share them with people that, that aren't really pursuing the cross. Why? The Bible, the scripture says, if you teach a wise man, he will grow wiser. But if you teach a fool, you're just wasting your time. And I'm not trying to be mean to you guys tonight. As I go forward, I want you to go forward. <laughs> the conservatory is going in, in the direction that we need to go in in this hour. And I'm grateful when our teachers can bring it. Listen, study from whatever version of the Bible you want, because we're in different phases, different places of life. But I'm going to tell you, when you get serious, your study needs to come from serious Bible. Not religion. Listen, a lot of these Bibles are theologies. And they're written in the way that people believe. And they're pushing particular theologies on you, which is why certain word choices are, are changed. I only deal with formal Bibles when I study. I don't use any paraphrase or any um, what I call commentary type Bibles. Thank you. Sam just posted it. I couldn't remember. It says, give instruction to a wise man and he will be still wiser. Teach a man and he will increase in learning. And there's a, another passage, if you can find it, um, a minister, a Prophet Sam, it talks about um, giving, well, we already know casting pearls among swine. That's New Covenant. But there are quite a few um, passages that talk about teaching fools. And all that means is teaching people who refuse to change and refuse to learn. It's not for me. I mean, the way God has built me, if I see a little progress, I'm going to stick with people because I know that sometimes you have to hammer and hammer and hammer and hammer and hammer and hammer and hammer. But if I'm hammering and nothing is falling off, I have to exit the room. We all do. We have to, you know, we have to, but just be encouraged. I know it's late. I know we've been on a long time, but I'm telling you, that fourth prophet, to me, is the most significant teaching of all the prophets. But most people don't teach that one. They think the righteous man is an English word. Oh, he's a righteous man. And when you understand that in context with the Pharisees and scribes, it's going to blow you up. Because the battle was not about Works, status, acquiring things. It was about the righteousness of God himself. The ultimate calling of salt. God bless you all. If there are questions, um, about Apostle Pam's teaching tonight if you want to go in further discussion. Listen, I don't know, but I'm revived tonight and I'm open for it. And Apostle Pam, we can tag team. Listen, I'm looking for people who are ready to go somewhere in God, not in an organization. If that's you and you feel connected to the Scribal Conservatory or you feel that God is leading you um, to just, you know, mantle yourself in a different way in this season. I just want to encourage you. Also, when the scripture, 2 Kings 2, referred to your master, your master, 
I want you to understand that they weren't talking about lordship. That's not what that means. Listen, if you want to be a part of this ministry, grow with us virtually or in person. Listen, connect with Apostle Pam. I'm asking you or collect, connect with Prophet Sam. Um, connect with Minister Chiquita um, and give them your contact information. We'll reach out to you. We're going to continue to do. I'm going to personally um, be calling people forth in the conservatory. Um, so just we're going to a place. And we're going to get there. There will be people who will not like the direction of the conservatory, but hey, not everybody can follow you into your next place. And that's not, that doesn't mean anything wrong with them. It just means they may have changed frequencies. Because we're on a frequency right now. There's a sound we're following. In my book, Literary Evangelism, I, I wrote, oh, 14 years ago, I talk about the sound of God. And the frequency of God. 14 years I wrote that book. And I thank God that it's even more prevalent now. So listen, questions tonight, I understand if you have some. Um, but there's a lot God is opening up. And a lot God is taking us back to. And just be in the realm to be brought back. There's a song I grew up listening to. It says... The, all of it is not a great, but it says, um, take me back to the place where I first believed. That doesn't mean take me backwards. That's not what that lyric means in that passage. It means cause me to remember how much I loved you then. And how you filled me. And the hunger. And the thirst. You know, enjoy your journey. A lot of potholes, no graves. For me, a lot of potholes, but no graves. If somebody try to throw me in a grave now, look, I'm gonna be like, like putting sand in it, digging, building. <laughs> I'm like, okay, no. <laughs> so I'm asking you guys. Trust God. The greatest anointing you will ever need is in Jesus Christ. Now, David said, I don't need Saul's armor. <laughs> I don't need Saul's armor. Elisha saw his leader. He saw his senior prophet. He saw the apostle that was leading him. That's what he saw, but not master. Not the master of the English language. Not the Lord of King James. He understood for a moment until he didn't. And when you take your eyes off salt, all kinds of things happen to you. But I am convinced that the key to miracles signs and wonders is the righteous of the righteous. I'm blessed in this hour, I tell you, with covenant relationships. I realize I haven't been around a lot of righteous of the righteous. But listen, this is a new day. I'm done. I'm muting myself. Comments, questions, if you want to, Terry, you can. Um... Prayer has already gone forth. Um, yes, you can stop recording now. <laughs>